want to continue sharing on how we are God's gladiators in the kingdom of God. And what does that look like? How do we conduct ourselves as God's gladiators? Last week, I had a lot of good feedback. We had our, our pot blessed dinner together and it was fun. And I really enjoyed the feedback and one of the things that really encouraged me in what I need to be sharing is what does that look like? What does it look like to be a gladiator? Well, I'm going to get into a lot of things, but let me simplify it for you. Mothers who are protecting their children's moral innocence are gladiators. Dads who are providing a covering, a vision, and protection over their marriages, over their children, are gladiators. Gladiators are watching what their children are being taught. That's what a gladiator does. It's our responsibility, the book of Deuteronomy says, to teach our children the ways of the Lord when they get up, when they go through the day, and when they lie down. God has given our children over to us and we're to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So that's what gladiators do. Gladiators protect again their children from sexual predators, both physically and psychologically. Gladiators are willing to go to a school board meeting and make sure there's no pornography in our libraries. That's a gladiator. That's not being mean. That's not being disrespectful or rude to other, other people, but it's a contender of the faith and a protector of the things of the kingdom of God. Gladiators simply engage in spiritual warfare. In Matthew chapter 11, we looked at verse 12. It says that from the days of John until now, the kingdom suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. We are not violent against flesh and blood and mean-spirited or disrespectful, but there's a fighting spirit, a warring spirit in the new birth, in the born-again spirit that fights against sickness. A gladiator is someone who gets mad at sickness and quits whining to God like a baby to please heal me and gets angry at the devil for trying to steal my healing that Jesus bought and paid for and now fights against the sickness. If you think you're gonna go through this life and not have to fight against disease and sickness and, and issues in your body, then you're not well prepared as a gladiator in the kingdom of God. I had to get past God's will to prosper me. I had to get past God's will that he wishes above all things that I prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers. And I had to come to a place that I got angry against poverty and what it does to families, what it does to our homes, what it does to our legacy, what it does to a culture. Poverty is a curse. And the devil is the author of it. And a gladiator says, enough is enough. We're not gonna debate God's will anymore. We know God's will. Now we're gonna fight a good fight against poverty. We're gonna believe for our prosperity and get angry about any poverty trying to work its way into our life. So gladiators aren't angry at people. They're angry at the devil. Amen. They're not fighting flesh and blood, but they are fighting principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. Gladiators are defenders and declaration, if you will, speakers of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Amen. And that God through his kingdom has come to fix what sin has broke. Gladiators have a revelation of the kingdom and that it is attacked, but we take it, we take what Jesus bought and paid for by force. 
against demonic activity. Now, if those demons come through people, I pray for them. But I'm not going to compromise my faith in any public battle. I'm going to contend for the faith that has been delivered unto me. And I'm not ashamed to publicly say, Jesus loves you, repent therefore. Jesus has died for your sins, turn from them therefore. Jesus wills nothing but goodwill towards you. Now repent and come to him. Jesus loves you, do you love him? He said, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So a gladiator deals with personal issues in their own life and fights against things that are against the kingdom of God. Then once we have received and once something has happened in us, we're willing to contend for the faith publicly, not compromise the faith publicly. That's a gladiator. Paul speaks of fighting in 2 Timothy chapter four. It's toward the end of his life here. And he says in verse six, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. He's coming to the end of his life. He knows that he's about to go home to be with the Lord and look at what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. God doesn't will just for you to enter the kingdom of God and go stealth as a Christian. God wills for you to enter the kingdom of God and now in seeing it through the new birth and in the entering of that kingdom will come opposition. In Acts chapter 14, I think it's about verse 22, Paul says that we through much tribulation shall enter the kingdom of God. He's not talking about, talking about going, going to heaven. He's talking about God's kingdom that's here right now. The rule and reign of Jesus in your life will be met with opposition and you have to learn to fight. You have to be equipped to fight. You have to learn how this is not a fight in the flesh or after the flesh, but it is a real dog fight to maintain what Jesus has obtained through his death, burial, and resurrection. And he says, with much tribulation, will you enter God's rule in your life, God's reign in your life, God's dominion over every part of your life. And Paul says, man, I've done that. I fought a good fight. I've done, now listen, this is good. I've done what I taught a young pastor Timothy to do. I told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold unto the eternal life that you've been called to and have made a good profession or confession in the presence of many witnesses. Listen, your, your relationship with Jesus is private and personal, but your faith is public. I'm going to say it again. Your relationship with the Lord is very intimate. It's very personal. It's private, but your faith is not. Your faith is not. He says, hold and lay hold unto that confession, that profession of faith that you made before many witnesses. You know, I'm just not sure what gospel is being preached in America today and how so few it seems like really love Jesus, really know Jesus, really have laid their lives down for the faith. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 says, And they, speaking of believers, overcame him, speaking of the devil, by the blood of the lamb. That's what Jesus did for you in grace. And the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. Where are these people? I'm not condemning you if you're you're lukewarm. I'm trying to get you hot. Amen. Amen. 
I'm not condemning you if your commitment is shallow. I'm encouraging you to get some depth to your commitment to Jesus, your loyalty, loyalty to Jesus. We have so many in the church that are more loyal to race than they are grace. More loyal to politics than they are to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They don't love their lives or no longer love their lives unto death. Jesus said, it was Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 through 34. He says that if you will confess me before men, that's public. I will confess you before my father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. I didn't write the Bible. I don't know why people get upset at me. I'm telling you what Jesus said. Yeah, but why don't you take some time and tell us what that means? It means confess Jesus publicly and don't be ashamed now of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed. Don't let people shame you of what God says is moral. Don't be ashamed, listen, of sanity. Don't be ashamed of this is right and this is wrong. You know, Romans chapter one, verse 16 is where Paul said that. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1, 16. And then he outlines enemies of the gospel and cultural opposition to the gospel and literally starts to declare the pathway to a reprobate mind. And that there are people that know there's a God and they won't glorify him. Neither are they thankful. And then he deals with sexual perversion of how it destroys the mind, it destroys the body, it can destroy a culture and that there's a point of no return on that train in which you need to get off and these people who are on the path of a reprobate mind, they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness and at the end of the train to hell, they encourage others to disobey God, to reject God, to deny God. And yet we have people all through the body of Christ that say, well, we just want to preach the gospel. We don't want to deal with these cultural issues. Did Jesus not include changing the culture in the gospel? We have forgotten what the gospel is. It's the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's the gospel of God's reign over your sexuality, over your finances, over your health, over your marriages, over your child rearing and raising, over your witnessing. Do I, somebody better nod their head to God or I'll preach. We have forgotten the gospel. It's the gospel. Calm down, Dwayne. Count to 10. One. That, that spirit of that gladiator just rises up in me sometimes. And some people are so carnal, they think I'm coming after them. I'm not coming after you except to hug you. I'm coming after principalities and powers and wickedness in high places that are destroying our lives. That Jesus, oh man, that Jesus come and came to disarm. Jesus has disarmed all this evil. And we are emboldening them in our silence. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about rude. I'm talking about a love for Jesus and a love for your neighbor as yourself. I'm talking about doing unto others the golden rule in Matthew 7 and in Luke chapter 6 of doing unto others truly as I would have done unto me. I would want you to protect my children because you love them. So I'm going to protect yours. I would want you 
to if you're tempted to sleep with my wife, to resist. Because <laughs> you don't want to mess with me. I'm, I'm very discriminated <laughs> about who sleeps with Sue. <laughs> and I just might get in the flesh. <laughs> we have fought a good fight. We're going to finish our course. And what does that mean? Paul says it means he kept the faith. How many people are rejecting the faith? How, do, how does that happen to good Christians? We quit fighting the good fight. We forget we have a course. God has a plan for our lives to be a blessing, to be a light, to be salt. We've seen a change in our Oklahoma legislation where we've had decades to fight, to pray, to put people in office. I remember I came up under a, <laughs> oh, that just came to me. I came up under a system where we were told you can't mandate morality. And so people disengaged from politics and law godly government and it took a while for God to renew my mind that what do you think government ordained by God is here for? It's to protect the good and punish the evil. Amen. Romans chapter 13 calls them ministers that they wield the sword of God. And if you don't mandate with, with law a measure of morality, I promise you the devil will mandate with law immorality. I know with law, we can't change people's hearts. That's where the gospel comes in, but we can put a restraint on sin. Godly government puts a restraint on sin. And so we've prayed for our, our, our leaders like the Bible tells us to do. And we've seen people in our locations run for office and get in get in power in our state legislation. And they've just passed a bill last week that you cannot impose hormone blockers on our children or mutilate their bodies in their adolescence. Who would, who would come against that? Who wouldn't want your children in their moral innocence protected and in their immaturity? They, they don't know who they are yet. They don't know what they want to be. Anybody's raised one of these dudes knows they changed their mind 20 times. They're going to be a fireman for a week. They're going to be a policeman for a week. They're going to... And you would think everybody would celebrate, but oh no. Opposition to protecting minors from mutilating their bodies. Putting chemicals in their bodies. Trying to block your natural hormonal makeup that God Almighty put on the inside of you. And one of the biggest dark arguments on the floor was you just hate. What are they called? Transgenders. You just hate transgenders. And see, we used to just sit here and let that intimidate us and silence us. And we don't want to be called transgender haters. When, 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 do, we, when do we become a gladiator for the kingdom of God? And, and when do we stand up and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, let me answer that question with a question. Why do you hate children in the womb? And if the womb doesn't become a tomb, you're still not satisfied. You hate them in the elementary school now. You hate what God, why do you hate? We need to start asking the question, why do people hate Jesus so much? Amen. Amen. We don't need to be on the defense all the time. And I'm not talking about being mean. 
I'm talking about loving people enough to tell them the truth in love as a gladiator for the kingdom of God. That everybody's going to bow their knee eventually. I'm welcoming you to do it now. But any minute Jesus may appear and I'm sorry, he's going to mandate you bow your knee and confess that he is Lord. We have backslidden so far that I sound radical. This is what amazes me. I am not radical. Y'all don't believe that, do you? <laughs> I'm not radical. I'm saying I have the mind of Christ that I've armed myself with. And I love people with the kind of love that Jesus had. I fought a good fight. I fought finish my course. Let me just say this. You won't finish your course in this culture if you don't learn to fight a good fight. I kept the faith. I contended for the faith and didn't renounce my faith or compromise my faith. Boy, and I like this. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day. Now look at this. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Part of being a gladiator is we know Jesus is coming back any minute. And he died for the sins of the whole world. He died for our health, our wealth, our eternity, our homes, our children, our neighbors. And he could come back. I love his appearing. And that's what motivates me to fight. I'm not angry at anybody. I'm not mad. I have righteous anger against the devil that's destroying people's lives. It's like we forget there's a hell. People are going to hell, saints. And we're standing around concerned we might be misunderstood. I'm not saying I'm not at times really concerned that I'm going to be misunderstood. But how do, I, how do I fight? How do I take upon me the spirit of a gladiator? I put to death my love for myself and you accepting me. Go to Jude, a book nobody goes to. I mean, I guarantee you, you can go to church your whole life and no one ever turned to Jude. Really? I'm serious. I grew up in church my whole life and I don't remember one time the preacher said, go to Jude. It's like, ignore that book. That doesn't fit our cultural Christianity. The book of Jude does not fit our cultural Christianity. See, many people, listen to me, loved ones. Listen to me, dear ones. Many people who claim to be a Christian today are not born again. They're just cultural Christians. They, they grew up in a Christian home and they were around the truth. They weren't lovers of the truth. They heard about Jesus. Jude was the brother of Jesus. Jude grew up. I mean, man, my heart goes out to Jude. Jude grew up in the same home that Jesus was raised. And it wasn't until after the resurrection that Jude put faith in, oh my goodness, I was raised around God, but he wasn't saved. He had to deal, Jude had to deal with things you've never had to, to deal with. Jude's about to get a spanking and he, he'd look at Mary or, or Joseph and say, well, what about Jude? How come he never gets a spanking? Don't you know it was hard on Mary not to go, cause he's God. <laughs> Can you imagine how hard it was on Mary to even harbor all these things in her heart, who Jesus was and the persecution and the false accusations. 
And then the, then the, he's God. He's an illegitimate child in their minds. Can you imagine being with all the women in the city at some, some tea party and everybody's bragging on their kids? Well, my kid is this fast and my kid's this smart and my kid won this award. And, and you're sitting there and going, my kid is God. <laughs> Created everything. Top that. <laughs> Jude comes to a revelation of who Jesus is and accepts him as his personal Lord and Savior. The entire family thought Jesus was nuts at large. Sorry. Some of you have never been to Jude, so I thought I'd tell you who he is. Look at verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. <laughs> it... it, it it was a remarkable act of humility to me to not still put in there and Jesus's brother or at least half brother. No, I'm a bond servant. He was my brother. We came of the same mother, but I'm a bond servant to this man. I came to a place I realized he's God made flesh. He's the savior of the world. He's the promised Messiah, the seed. There was the promised seed to come. Listen, to fix everything sin has broke. One of the reasons I believe many of you are going to be champion gladiators is because you know the brokenness of sin. You, you know what it did to your marriage. You know what it did to your mind. You know what it did to your body. You know what it did to friendships. You know the guilt you know the shame, you know the pain that sin brings and you don't want that for anybody. A gladiator is one who fights in the public square. That's what gladiators did, they fought. Uh, I don't wanna call her name, I almost said her name, it was right there and I, I still wanna say Jennifer but I'm not gonna say Jennifer but you gotta know it's Jennifer, even though I don't wanna call her name out publicly, but she needs to show you her shirt. She is a proud gladiator in the kingdom of God. I love her shirt. Everybody needs to see her shirt before you leave. Yeah, stand up, Jennifer. Look at that shirt. I am a gladiator for Jesus. See, we gotta get past this being ashamed of our identification with Jesus. That we can't help it that he's always right. Well, you just think you're always right. Well, no, I don't think I'm always right. I know Jesus is always right. And when I agree with him, that makes me right. Hallelujah. I'm not ashamed to go, I'm gonna see what Jesus said about this issue and have a biblical worldview. See my world through the glasses of the kingdom and Jesus Christ and what he has done to break the power of sin that destroys people's lives. Why, why in the church do we want to never condemn you, but always believe for the Holy Spirit to convict you if there's something in your life that is sinful, we don't want to run you away. We want to hug you and help you break the power of that. Not because we're self-righteous, but we know that sin will mess you up somewhere. And we don't want you messed up. Amen. I want you happily married, not just married. So we got to repent of some stuff. I want your kids functional. So we got to change our minds about some stuff. Hallelujah. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. So he starts off with our identification with Christ, with the power of the blood, of what the blood did for us, how that the blood of Jesus has separated you. Where's the doctrine of separation in the church? I'm not talking about isolation, but there is a doctrine of separation. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. 
and I'll be your God and you'll be my people. There is a separate, you're called and sanctified, set apart by God the Father and preserved. Jesus in his blood has preserved you and now made you salt to preserve your families, your careers, your vocations. Mercy, I love this start off. <laughs> Mercy, peace and love be multiplied unto you. It's like he's warming us up before he slaps the fire out of us. <laughs> God's mercies upon you. He just loves you so much and his peace is being multiplied now. Same thing Jesus did in Revelation 2 and in Revelation 3. He'd come to the church and he'd say, man, you guys are doing so good, but I got a problem. And he confronted them, not condemning them, not mean-spirited, out of love. Then he ends each church he addresses with, and you're doing so good, and I'm so proud of you, and keep up the good work. It's like a sandwich technique. I love you. Bam, I love you. <laughs> Jude's warming us up. Man, mercy upon you. You guys are called. You're preserved by God. Verse three, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, we all have a common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once, which was once for all delivered to the saints. I was gonna just write you and just talk about how blessed we are. We have this common salvation. We're sanctified. We're the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. We're just so blessed coming in and out. I just wanted to go over the common salvation. But I found it necessary to exhort you to contend for the faith. Wow. Contend means to fight for. Literally in the dictionary, it means to struggle for or because of. To struggle with an adversary. Literally, that's what that word means. And I think I said dictionary, that was the strongest concordance of the original language. Contend earnestly. One of the definitions in the original language is to fervently fight for what is pure, moral, godly, just, righteous, holy, virtuous. For certain men on Facebook, Twitter, six o'clock news. See, when this was written, they didn't have access to people infiltrating the church like we do now. I hope you caught my little joke because it's not a joke. I mean, I, I love you. Everybody say, I love, I love. Brother Dwayne. I just needed a hug before I say this, a group hug. I remember ministering on child training and trying to explain to Christian parents, you need to police everything your children watch on social media. There never should be a surprise for a parent that your children are being bullied, cyber bullied on social media. And I, I, I was shocked at how many parents went, well, my, my kids have come to me and said, that's private. Their, their phones are private. Yeah, we've got a better crowd here. <laughs> better than I even thought. There is nothing they're saying on social media that's private and personal under your authority. And until they get married and you, and you break that parental cord, they're under your covering, 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 covering. They're not going to, I'm not going to allow my kids to communicate with, with human traffickers, drug dealers. Pedophiles, bullies. 
since you did so good on that, you emboldened me. There's no such thing as Sue telling me I can't see what's on her phone. Or me saying to Sue, you can't see who I'm talking to on my phone or what I'm saying to who. See, you didn't jump on that one. You were too quiet. Sue is under my covering, my headship. And I have a right to know who she's talking to, who she's meeting with. I'm not talking about, again, obsessive, compulsive type behavior. I'm talking about love. That I protect my marriage. Boy, y'all aren't jumping on this one. That's all right. I love you. The Sue has a right to come to me and ask me of any, anybody I'm communicating with, any tweet I've put out, any Facebook message. If you'd have done better, I would share more. That we don't understand the battle we're in. We don't understand there are spiritual forces trying to destroy your marriage. And that right now they're creeping in even to the church through social media. Most of the people running off into adultery. Are we still okay that adultery is wrong? I'm okay that adultery is wrong. I don't have to apologize that adultery is wrong, but some of you aren't sure, I guess, because people have crept in unawares through social media and you're entertaining a relationship with somebody on social media that's inappropriate. Well, you're just being a control freak. No, I'm being a gladiator that will cut somebody's head off spiritually. <laughs> then we look at David and we can't even get the spiritual picture. I realize we're not under the old covenant and that the battle isn't physical, but to think there isn't a battle that's just as vicious and violent as old covenant warfare is to be deluded and deceived. The philosophies of today are Goliaths coming into our homes that if you get under my protection, I'm telling you, I will cut their heads off and hang it up and show you this philosophy is dead. I didn't play with it. I didn't just cut it. I cut its head off. <laughs> Colossians chapter two, verse eight says that it's the philosophies of this world, the mindsets of this world that's spoiling us. Where are the gladiators to cut their heads off? Whoa, I wasn't asking, but I know which side to go to now. <laughs> Amen. The philosophies of there's 57 genders. I'm not going to play with that. I'm not going to be mean to you if you think you have 16 personalities. I'm just going to cast 15 out. Amen. And I'm going to love you the whole time. I'm going to hug you while I'm rebuking the devil. Amen. I'm going to cut its head off. I'm told by God, these five kings, you cut their heads off. And Samuel didn't do it. Amen. I'm sorry, I got excited. Sue, you can see anything on my phone. I have nothing to hide. Amen. Why would you hide anything from your spouse? You don't want the answer. Because you're doing something you know is wrong. Amen. Did I start the marriage seminar early? I'm so sorry. I think that's in August, right? Ah, that spirit just got ahead of myself. Verse four again, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, unnoticed, who 
long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who do not believe. See, people don't want to hear that anymore, that wrath is coming. I'm not saying God is wrathful with us right now and pouring wrath out on us. Jesus bore the wrath of God. But there is an entire generation that is rejecting Jesus and trying to get you to reject Jesus. I'm here. Hallelujah. You have to contend for the faith. I won't go on reading, but you need to take time and go on reading the things that Jude addressed. That deny the lordship of Jesus. That pervert the grace of God. And yet many of these things are paraded even in our churches. In our churches. Again, David is such an example of a gladiator, a warrior. And we need to learn some spiritual principles from David. Listen at the, listen at the Passion Translation the Passion Translation of verses three and four of, of Jude. Verse three in the Passion Translation, dearly loved friend, I love that. Dearly loved friend, I was fully intending to write to you about our amazing salvation we all participate in, but I felt the need instead to challenge you to vigorously defend and contend for the beliefs that we cherish. I'm not ashamed to defend sexual purity. I cherish it. For God, through the apostles, has once for all entrusted these truths to his holy believers. I get so entertained at Christians that never read their Bibles. Maybe were raised around Jesus, but don't know Jesus. And they say things that just amaze you and you just wonder, have you not read the Bible at all to embrace that, that, that philosophy? And do you not understand that the, the church is here as custodians of the truth? If we're not going to speak the truth to our children, if we're not going to speak the truth about God's kingdom, who is? If we're not going to be the ones that define according to God, this is right, this is wrong, who is? If Jesus and the Bible is not final authority, who is? The Supreme Court, the Democratic Party, the lukewarm Republicans? The anchor on a six o'clock news, a professor on a college campus. It's like we've forgotten who we really are. We are as confused in our identity as this generation that's being raised. We don't know who we are. We're custodians. We're gladiators of the truth. Verse four. In the Passion Translation, there have been some who have sneaked in among you unnoticed. They are depraved people whose judgment was prophesied in the scripture a long time ago. They have perverted the message of God's grace into a license to commit immorality and turn against our only absolute master, our Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah. I'm not condemning those people. They were condemned in scripture millenniums ago. They're depraved. They're not content hating God by themselves. They're not content going to a devil's hell. They want to drag your kids. They want to drag your spouses. They want to drag a culture with them. And somebody has to say enough is enough. I love you enough to tell you the truth 
don't follow these depraved people. Again, David in 1 Samuel, I think it's 1729, when he was facing this uncircumcised blasphemer, said to his brother and to all of Israel, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? What will it take for the great awakening? What will it take for a nation to be woke up? What will it take for the church to be woke up out of our sleep and slumber, out of our apathy, out of our unwillingness to be a gladiator? What will it take? I wish I had the answer for that. I'm just believing that there has to be a remnant. There has to be a church that really wants to be a church. I know all of you probably aren't committed like you need to be, but you're here. You're on a slippery creek bank. If you stay with me and the leadership of this church for very long, you're going to end up in the water. You're going to slip in to loving Jesus with all your heart, all your might, all your strength, and now your neighbor as yourself. When did we quit teaching a generation? Daniel chapter three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when government officials that are corrupt. Why do you think we have a constitution? Because the founders knew the history of man without God is tyranny. Man without God will oppose God and anyone who loves God. And they saw it historically for thousands of years. Dictators, despots, tyranny drunk on power and the blood of the saints. They saw it in the Bible. They were taught. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That here are people that love God and a corrupt politician, a corrupt leader at the very top, Nebuchadnezzar, builds a 90 foot golden statue, nine foot wide and brings in an orchestra And it says, when the orchestra lights up, you will bow down and worship this golden image. And the three Hebrew children wouldn't do it. They weren't mean-spirited. They weren't attacking anybody. They were loving God. Boy, this is so easy to me. Why is this so hard? They loved God and God said, thou shalt not have any graven images before me and thou shalt not bow thy knee to any graven images. And while they're, they're loving, while they're participating in their, in their culture at some level, they're contending for the faith and not compromising. And the king found out and he was angry. And here's what the devil always do. The king says, I love you boys. I like you. You're in authority. I I appreciate you, but we're going to crank this band up again. And you're going to bow. The devil will always give you an opportunity to compromise. He'll give you an opportunity to compromise with your kids. Compromise in the workforce. Compromise when a camera's stuck in your face. He'll always give you a second chance. And I wish I had time. I was going to turn over there. Thank God I got another session or two with you. I don't know if I'm, I wanted to preach on other things, but you're not doing very well. (laughs) But they were clear. They said, let's be clear that our God is well able to deliver us. We will not bow to this graven image and our God is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, What you're supposed to see in that is we're not contending to get something. We're contending because we are already something in God. If God doesn't deliver us, it doesn't change contending for the faith. We're not attacking you. We're defending the faith. We're contending for the faith. We got a whole generation that's never heard those three boys' name. We got preachers don't know who they are. They don't know who Daniel is. They don't know the story of Daniel. How can you vote for these corrupt politicians and know the story of Daniel? Knowing that political powers, drunk on power, will even create law 
to persecute you, prosecute you, and if they can, execute you. What is the mystery? Why? I am a slow guy. I'm not real bright, but I can read Daniel and go, I'm not voting for anybody that's going to, by law, come against my faith. I'm not going to empower a government to persecute me, to prosecute me. I'm not going to empower a government that'll send the FBI after me when I'm at a school board meeting simply defending my children. I'm not going to stand up and let them call me terrorist. They work for us. We don't work for them. Some of you have just lost everything. You've lost, you quit contending. You quit fighting the good fight. You're not even running your race. And you're embarrassed of the faith. And Daniel, Daniel, again, I'm out of time. I'm in the red. I've taught you when I'm in the red, that's Jesus. <laughs> I was raised Pentecostal. You read the red, believe for the power. So we're in the power phase here in closing. Just hang on. Corrupt politicians move on the powers that be and make a decree in law knowing Daniel will follow his conscience and his God. And this is how we can ensnare them. Wake up. They pass a law that for 30 days, nobody can pray to another God, but to the king. And Diarus, that king was a good king. Darius, that's what I said. I don't care what you heard. <laughs> Darius was a good king. But corrupt politicians under demonic influence passed a law to ensnare a man of God, a, gla a gladiator for Jesus. And what's interesting about it, when the law was passed, it says that Daniel went into his, his place of prayer with the window open. He was not ashamed of his God. He wasn't ashamed of his faith. But you're not gonna tell me I can't pray to my God. I do it three times every day and I'm gonna keep doing it now. It's a good thing I'm out of time. Because how many of us would have closed that window and maybe not even prayed for 30 days because we want to keep peace. A peace that's not in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Daniel, the window's open. Let me push it up a little higher. <laughs> Amen. That's a gladiator. So you're not going to tell me my role over my children, God already has. My role over my home, my marriage, God already has. My vocation and how sacred it is and how I'm under commandment to preach the gospel to everything that moves. To go into all the world and preach this gospel and everyone that believes shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned. That's not being mean. That's loving people enough that you care about their eternal soul. And yet the world and the devil will turn that around on you and call you all kinds of names and try to pass laws that you can't even preach the gospel. And we're asleep. Wake us up, oh God, in the name of Jesus to be gladiators in his kingdom and see a generation saved and not lost. Father, in the name of the Holy Child Jesus, I thank you for stretching forth your hand across this great nation, across our hearts first, our church, our city, and our great nation. Thank you for calling your people home. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering us with your very presence that our boldness is not after the flesh, that our boldness is from being with Jesus. Thank you for stirring our hearts 
and that no one within the sound of my voice in the name of Jesus will leave one step further from God, but all will be one step closer to God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.